Hello, it's noon, Friday, February 20, uh, February, what, uh, 16. Uh, welcome to Relentless Learning. We do this most Fridays at noon Pacific. Um, I want to um, talk a little bit about Relentless Learning. For those of you who haven't been here before, uh, I have, I'm very excited about today's show. I have a very special guest. All my guests are special, but, but a very special guest, uh, Rich Sheridan. He's in the green room. He's going to be joining us in just a little bit. Um, every week in Relentless Learning, we present two uh, big ideas. Um, to me, these are kind of aha moments where we see the world differently. And because of that, we're able to uh, see the world more clearly. And, and these are things that will help others. So um, the two big ideas today, Rich is going to talk about joy um, being at the center of your company's intention. And I'm going to talk briefly about uh, how I schedule for success and how we can uh, leverage uh, things like scheduling to help us do more and, and achieve more. Uh, just a few tips and tricks. Uh, last week I talked about email and how we can have a zero inbox. This week I'm gonna talk about how I use calendar, uh, calendar functions and maybe there's something in there that will help you. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking about that in a little bit. Uh, coming ahead next week, every, about every month we have a, a live seminar um, where I'm going to talk for 45 minutes or more on a particular topic in the VUCA world. And this uh, next week is going to be navigating finance in a VUCA world. I'm going to talk about things like capital, capitalization of software. I'm going to talk about incentives. I'm going to talk about uh, product versus project funding. Uh, I'm going to talk about technical debt, et cetera, and how we deal with that uh, from, a, from a finance standpoint. And we do have speakers uh, through most of March, but I'm currently looking for a speaker for March 1st. That's two weeks from today. Uh, I invited a lot of you here because I expected that some of you not only would be interested in what we're doing, but would like to be a speaker. So if you're interested in becoming a speaker at Relentless Learning, uh, please reach out to me. There's links in the comments. For those of you who don't know, this uh, Relentless Learning is sponsored by the VUCA MBA. And what is the VUCA MBA? Well, VUCA is a term that comes to us from the military to describe the world we're in. It stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Uh, I think we can all agree that as technology changes, as the world changes, it's getting a little bit more VUCA uh, every day. Um, the MBA part of the VUCA MBA is Mindset for Business Agility. This is an actual uh, three-day class that I've come up with over the years to help people understand the VUCA world and not only um, survive in the VUCA world, but thrive in the VUCA world. I had a couple of things that I have given away in the past and I will continue to give away um, through this particular medium. Uh, I have QR codes. If you want a copy of my latest book, which is called Apke's Golden Rule of Agile, Focus on Value Delivery, uh, you can use this QR code uh, and uh, give me your name and email address and we'll send you a digital copy. Second thing is I have another offer for those of you who want to spend some time. I'm, I'm willing to give a, a one hour free consulting on, on relative backlog estimation. I think it's a real game changer. Um, and if you're interested in that, there's another QR code, another place where you can sign up and we'll get you on the calendar so that we can do that for you and your company. And then the special event, as I mentioned before, on February 23rd about finance. This is something that's coming up. I encourage you folks to, to join me. There's a lot about finance and incentives that really uh, give us a systemic way of becoming agile or, or having agility. And, and I want to show you some of the things uh, from the world of finance that will help you. And then uh, there are some helpful links that I've already posted into the comments. They are listed here, but you can get them in the comments. Um, the other thing I want to say before I get started with my big idea is if you want to uh, interact with Rich and myself, the way that you will do that is you can put things into the comments and then we can uh, react to them after the presentations today. Um, and folks have already started. Uh, Eddie says, hello from California. Uh, I'm obviously joining from the Bay Area and, and Rich is joining us from, uh, uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So uh, it'd be interesting to see where we get uh, some of our uh, people from. So without further ado, I wanna get into my idea for the day, um, which I'm calling scheduling for success. 
And I want to just show you a few things. I want to keep it simple. Last time, I think I tried to bite off too much, um, but I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple. These are things that I do. Uh, I'm not saying that you necessarily need to do them. Maybe there's something there that you'll learn from that help me to stay on top of what I'm doing. There's just so much hitting us. When we talk about VUCA world, there's so much hitting us. Things are changing so frequently. How can we take and schedule for success? Um, and I did talk uh, a few uh, episodes back about um, cadence and investment. How do we start making these things real for our lives? And, and I always like to start with why. Uh, why is this so important that we schedule for success? Well, for me, um, obviously my perspective, us humans only have a finite resource when it comes to time. And it's probably the most valuable thing we do. If you think about work and you think about other things, basically what we're doing when we work in some cases, uh, especially if we're working for another person, is we're trading our time for money. But the, the problem is that you're only going to have so many days and hours and minutes and seconds on this world. So it's really important that the, what we spend our time on will determine our relative success in this world that is increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. It's, it's increasingly VUCA. So if we can take advantage of things like uh, some very simple tips on, on how we can do our, our calendaring and, and, and how we can use our schedules to help us be successful, then this is what I always refer to as an asymmetric payoff. This is something that's extremely valuable, but, but a, a very low uh, cost, so to speak. So here's a couple of tips for you. One, I think one of the things that we, we have is we have multiple calendars. And one of the things that I've been very uh, diligent on doing is making sure that if I have other calendars, whether they be family member calendars, whether they be work calendars, whether they be personal calendars, whether they be my consulting business, whether they be my nonprofit work, uh, I want to make sure that I can see everything on a single screen. Now, what I'm showing you here is just a simple screenshot of my calendar. It's in, uh, happens to be in Google uh, Calendar. And you can see that I have multiple calendars and they have different colors. So I can see where the entries are coming from. And I can see everything there so that I can make sure that my personal life and professional life and, and nonprofit, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and my kids' basketball games, I can make sure that there's time for them that we're not overlapping, that there's not conflicts. When you have multiple calendars, sometimes this is a problem. The other thing that I like to do, and here's another quick tip, is that there are different types of things on your calendar. Uh, for me, I calendar my work itself, and I'll talk about that in a second, and I have meetings, and I have meetings that are both in person, and I have meetings that are online, a lot of meetings on Zoom these days. What I want to do with my calendar is I want to color code certain things like an, uh, an online uh, event or meeting. I want to give a certain color so that I can see it very easily on my calendar. In-person meetings, I want to have a different color because those are things that I need to make sure that I'm prepared, that I'm dressed, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I have the time to make sure that if I'm driving from one place to another, I can drive one place to another. So I want to make sure that I color code my meetings. And this gets really important to me when I look at the different types of things that I'm putting on my calendar, which to some may seem a bit anal retentive. But one of the things that I talked about last week is take advantage of creating events from emails. If you're trying to go to a zero inbox, you only want to touch something once. If, a, if an email is something about an event or a work product or something that I need to do, if I want to do it, I need to schedule it. I'm very big about that. If we're going to be successful, we need to schedule things. We need to make sure that they're scheduled. So there's a really interesting thing on, on email where I can click on, and this is in, in Gmail, but I'm assuming in other Outlook and other things, where I can create an event. So if somebody sends me an email and I need to, to, to create a meeting with them, I can create an event and I can add them to that. I add my Zoom to it. I can color code it. I can make sure that it shows that time on my calendar is busy. This is, but but it may be something like somebody says, Larry, I I need to get your um, presentation uh, submission for the, this conference that's coming up, and it's due on a certain date. 
And so I know I need to do the work of creating that presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an event and I'm going to say for this presentation, maybe it's, I'm going to take two straight hours of my day. And I'm going to, to create that event. I'm going to put it somewhere on my calendar where I have free time so that it makes sure that I meet that deadline of spending the time and investing the time to make sure the work gets done. Again, I know it sounds pretty anal time when you see my schedule. It's, it's packed every day, but I get things done. Here's another thing that I think is really, really important. And I don't know how many people take advantage of it. And I think it's something that you all should probably consider taking advantage of. I just spoke about creating placeholders for work on my backlog. When I create these placeholders, I have the option of either marking the time as busy or free. And that's what this screenshot is showing you here. This is actually a screen capture uh, from my calendar. If I utilize the free status, and I encourage you folks to utilize the free status, what I can do is it will show up on my calendar but other people who have access to my calendar will see it as open. And I can see it as open as well, which means that if I need to schedule something at a particular time, I can schedule it at that time. And I have the flexibility of moving this particular event or scheduling thing because the status is free. This, this means a lot when you're using a calendar program. I'm going to talk about that in a second, like Calendly, which is what I use because it interacts with my, my Google calendar to show when I'm free. So if somebody, let's say Rich says, Larry, I'm so interested in your VUCA MBA. I wanna set up a half hour and talk with you about it. He's gonna see the time is free. And when, when Rich schedules that half hour, if it, if it conflicts with my placeholder, I can move my placeholder. I find myself sometimes moving them from one day to a next. I sometimes find myself making them smaller shrinking them here's an example of that place this is i have that finance seminar coming up next week i've done some pre-work but i haven't created the slides yet and i'm guessing it's going to take me roughly four hours probably not that long but it will certainly i can get it done in four hours so i set up a meeting you can see it's tentatively scheduled for wednesday the 21st from 8 to 12 to create that particular thing but my time is shown as free so if somebody wants to get that time, somebody let's say, again, Rich is going to set a meeting with me for a half hour and he sets it for nine o'clock on Wednesday, the 21st. I can move this placeholder to accommodate Rich's, but then it still shows me that I need to make sure that I find time for it. So I can move it around. I can shrink it. Maybe I think, gosh, I've done a lot more pre-work. I've, I've, I can shrink it down to two hours instead of four hours, or I can expand it from four, two hours to four hours, or I can break it into pieces. Maybe I do an hour on Tuesday, an hour on Wednesday, and two hours on Thursday. But taking advantage of having these blocks of time on my calendar allows me and makes sure that I do it. And one of the things is not only do I create events from the emails, but I also use Trello as my backlog, which I'm not going to show here, but I put things on my backlog. In fact, I have multiple backlogs. I have backlogs for my, my consulting business. I have backlogs for my personal business. I have, I have you know, lists for, for groceries. I, I, I'm a big backlog believer. If I, need, if I look at the backlog and something comes to the top and it's something I need to do, I will make sure that I copy that into my calendar and I will mark that time as free so that I make sure that I have the time to do it because time, again, is so precious. And, and, and this is, you know, kind of a, a, a opportunity cost. If I'm not doing the right thing that I should be doing at that time, um, I need to do it. Not everybody needs to do it. This is my thing. Uh, utilize online calendar software. I mentioned it before. Calendly is one. There's probably others. And use that so people can book time on your schedule. If you're showing time is free, they can book the free time. Follow up is a thing that I'm terrible with, and it's critical, especially if you run your own business. I, I need to follow up with somebody to say, hey, give me a call in two weeks. I need to make sure I do it. I was terrible with it. Some folks are good with it. Um, in, in addition to having the, the calendar, I utilize a CRM software, which logs my emails and allows me to create follow up. And I schedule time for correspondence. 
Uh, a couple times a day, I'll have something in my calendar will say, uh, you know, email, follow up, and I'll make sure that I have the time for it. So any emails that I need to respond to, I'll respond to usually a couple times a day. It's in my it's in my schedule, so I make sure that I do it. It's free, so I can move it if I need to. And then the last thing I do, and I'm looking at time. I, I know Rich is is anxious, and we're we're almost at time. Here's my last tip. I take uh, uh, a lot of advantage of repeating meetings, and usually they're free stuff. So here's just a, 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 an example, and this may be, again, too much anal retentive for some people, but I know that I need to sharpen my knives on a regular basis. I know that it takes me 30 minutes and I should do it every month. So what I've done is I've created a calendar item that says sharpen knives. It's The time is free. And I've scheduled it basically every month through repeating stuff. So when the time comes up, it reminds me I need to do it. And I also have the time to do it. If I need to move it, I can move it because, again, it's free. So I can move it to a place that I can use. I do the same thing like my dog, uh, Allie, uh, who you might every once in a while see in the background, uh, went to grooming yesterday. She needs to get groomed about every 10 weeks. So I set up something for every 10 weeks to remind me it's probably about time, though just looking at her usually reminds me. But then it makes sure that I have time to make the call and take care of the stuff. I go into that kind of detail. I don't know if it will be helpful for you all, but I have actually overrun my time and I'm more anxious to uh, uh, to bring Rich on. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to bring on our special guest this week, Rich Sheridan. Hey, Rich. Uh, Rich, you're muted. Hey, I agree. It's great to see you again. We were talking before uh, about how long we've known each other. It's been some time it that has, uh, we have we, known each yeah. other. We, I think we knew of each other before we met, but uh, we met in person at Agile Arizona way back in 2017. Yeah, 2017. <laughs> and and Rich Rich gave me a copy of his first book. He's got two books. We'll talk about that in a second. He gave me a copy, sad copy for my wife, Jana, uh, of Joy, Inc., which, which we treasure. We still have it. Um, so Rich and I do have this history. He's helped out, actually, with my nonprofit, Job Hackers, that some of you are familiar with. I'm, I'm no longer associated with them, but they're still going strong. Good. Um, he's presented at some of our meetups. Um, obviously, we've, we've been at conferences together, but but we knew of each other originally through my mentor, Tom Malash, uh, because Tom and Rich worked together in Ann Arbor. Uh, Tom's still in Ann Arbor. I'm assuming you see him from time to time. He is indeed, and I see him every now and then. Yeah. So we knew of each other. I got a chance to meet Rich. So so, so here's, here's the wonderful thing uh, about Rich. One, two magnificent books joy inc i want to make sure i get it right chief, the second one's chief joy officer i hope i'm saying it right yep and menlo innovation if you're not familiar with it it's probably one of the most agile software development companies on the planet when i talk to people I, I i very often some of you probably heard me talk about them before i said look menlo innovations great place to do software they took you know xp and and agility and they took it to heart and they still do it um, the, the story I always tell, and I'm assuming you're still doing this, every, every bit of software is paraprogrammed. Mm -hmm. um, you have this wonderful thing called, called high-tech anthropology so that you get to know your customer. I mean, just a super fantastic dynamic place, right? And so Rich has been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, when, when, let's talk about the starting. Um, when did you start Menlo Innovation? June of 2001. So it's been almost 23 years. Larry. Almost 23 years. And going strong, by the way. It is. We just had our two best years in a row ever, uh, 2022 20, and 23. But you, uh, if I remember the story correct, and you do recount this in, in uh, Joy Inc. about how you, you were introduced to kind of these uh, lessons of agility or, or whatever you want to call principles, whatever you want to call it. And, and you were able to take these things and actually make them part of the daily life at Menlo and, and obviously for the last 23 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the important part of the story that I think uh, often gets overlooked, but I think it's important to note, the first time I did created something at Menlo and I actually worked with Tom and my co-founder, uh, other co-founder, James Goebel on this, we did it inside of a tired old public company for two years. And so... 
we've done it twice now, uh, once transforming an existing organization between 1999 and 2001. And then when the internet bubble burst, uh, we realized we had built our first wonderfully running engine inside the Titanic. And uh, we decided uh, while I lost everything else, they couldn't take away what I'd learned in those two years. So everything you hear about Menlo, everything you just mentioned has been in place here from day one. Yeah. And, and you do have tours that, yes. that come through all the time. And yes. I encourage folks, if you, I haven't ha been able to make the tour, I haven't been to Ann Arbor in a long time, but um, I encourage people who make the tours. And how many people you have visit every year? You know, pre-pandemic, we had between three and 4,000 people visit a year. Amazing. Uh, then, of course, it all stopped. And then, good news, Larry, we learned how to do virtual tours. So you can be here on the click of a button. And now that people are coming back in person, we said, why would we stop the virtual tour? So those continue to this day. I think that's great. One of the things that we want to make sure is we'll get in the comments. I know maybe you have some of your fans who are on here and can put some of the links in the comments to the tours and other things. But I want to get to you have a big idea today um, yeah. and you're going to talk about making joy kind of the center of your business. So I'm going to get out of your way and let you do your thing. Um, and I'll see you in about 10 more minutes. And then those folks, I just want to remind folks, if you want to have questions, you got comments, please put them in the in the comments here on, on LinkedIn. And, and if there's questions, we'll try to get to them after the presentation. So uh, without further ado, Rich, take it away, please. Let's see. And I'm going to, I'm going to, add, I'm going to add this to the stage. I think that's what you want. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not as familiar with StreamYard as everything else out there. So, um, yeah, and what I want to do is uh, take a look at a part of business that I don't think many people who think about agility in their organizations actually take to heart. And that is, uh, I'm going to just simply say, if you're going to create an intentional culture, and most people would love to do that, and you don't take a hard look at your HR practices, um, and align them with your cultural intention, uh, you're probably going to miss the mark, essentially. So that's, I would say that's my simple uh, big idea here is uh, pick a cultural intention and then look at how you could make your traditional HR practices conform to that uh, intention. And as Larry, as you said, a lot of people come and visit here. It just happened yesterday. We had a big group of 16 people come in from a nearby organization called the University of Michigan, uh, part of their health system. And they asked the same question that almost everybody comes here, because we're a small company. We're about 50 people. And they said, Rich, how would this thing scale your make mistakes faster, babies in the workplace, your visual management systems, everybody's sitting in a big room together? And what I tell them is, number one, understand uh, there's not a bone in our body that says when you come to Menlo that you should try and copy us, that we found like the one true way of working. We have certainly found a way that works. And the delightful part of a tour is you come in and you see all of Menlo. You get a peek inside of a living, breathing organization. And really large organizations have grabbed big ideas from us, taken them home and implemented them. So uh, one of my standard jokes is that uh, Nationwide Financial down in Columbus grabbed a lot of our ideas. And so uh, I tell people, yeah, I don't know if it scales. Nationwide had it at 10,000 people. Maybe it doesn't go past 10,000. I don't know. Uh, but there's a lot of big stories here uh, in terms of what people have taken from here and taken into their organization. So today I want to talk about three things. What's the difference between an intentional culture and what I call a default culture? What are the principles that could be applied? And we should really look at those harder than we look at the specific practices. And what role does HR play in all of this? So I often say about default cultures that... Um, uh, they are often hero-based. Uh, they're defined by three questions. Who did we hire? What behaviors do we tolerate? And what attitudes walked in the door today? And default cultures can work really well for a really long time until one day they don't. And nobody knows why they were working. If they were personality-based and some personality got pulled out of the equation, suddenly they stop working and nobody knows how to get them back on track because there was no intention behind it. It was just something we did and how we treated each other and that sort of thing. I'll tell you where this journey started for me. Um, 
when I was a VP, newly minted VP, and by the way, that's not me, and that is not uh, my daughter, Sarah, just some iStock photos I use. But uh, it, when she was eight, uh, her um, school had this Take Your Child to Work Day program, and I took her in to watch the newly minted VP work, because apparently I was supposed to inspire her to a career of her own. Can you imagine a more boring day for an eight-year-old to watch a VP work? You know, oh, my dad does email all day long. Um, but uh, she sat at my task table. She wisely had packed coloring books, stickers, and crayons. And uh, at the end of the day, I thought, well, I better ask her because her teacher's going to ask her tomorrow. I said, so, Sarah, what did you learn today? Oh, my. Out of the mouths of babes. She said, what I learned, Dad, is you're really important here. I said, what? What do you mean? She said, what I saw is nobody here can make a decision without asking you first. Oh. She was right on the money. I had created a hero-based organization, and I was the number one hero. The only way to scale a hero-based organization is to scale the heroes. The only way to scale heroes is overtime. And I'm looking across the table at this eight-year-old thinking to myself, I don't want to miss the best parts of being a dad. So one of the things I will encourage all of your listeners to think about is that the journey has to start inside of you. There is no other place to start but inside of you. I had to become a different kind of leader. What is it about intentional culture that's different from a uh, uh, default culture? Well, number one, everybody understands it. Perhaps you can get so good at it, you could write a book about it or two. It is over It should be present in everything you do, in conversations you have, in practices you have. It should be obvious in all of the systems and practices, and it should align three fundamental perspectives on your organization. What does the world think about you? If you stopped anybody on the sidewalk and said, you know, what do they say about your company? People who don't know you, haven't been inside. What is the inside reality? What do people who work there say every single day? And then what is the heart of the visionary leaders of the company? And I will tell you, most organizations, you go in and those three data points are all over the map. You couldn't possibly draw a straight line. The closer you get those in alignment, suddenly the easier things get. For us, a lot of our Learning came from books way back in the early days. Kent Beck's Extreme Programming Explained, Alan Cooper's uh, uh, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum, uh, Don Norman's The Design of Everyday Things. Those informed what our goals were in terms of what we were trying to accomplish. But I will tell you the key thing for us is uh, what I learned in my hard lessons of an earlier managerial life was it's never been about technology. It's always been about the humans. So for us, we look to outside sources to help us learn how do we organize the humans more effectively. Center for Positive Organizations right at the University of Michigan Ross Business School nearby. The wonderful books by Patrick Lencioni and by the group then called Vital Smarts, now called Crucial Learning, books like Crucial Conversations and Influencer. And I will tell you, some of the most impactful books I've ever read in my life are the books from the Arbinger Institute. I cannot recommend them enough. So what role does HR play in all of this? And I will tell you that uh, one of the key things of, of a common phrase here at Menlo is let's run the experiment. The delightful thing about a phrase like that is it unleashes a lot of energy and it removes a lot of fear because people say, well, it's just an experiment. If people want to ask, we've had 29 Menlo babies here in the last 16 years. Larry, you asked me about that at the beginning. So just ask me if you want to in the Q&A about uh, the babies experiment, but it was a famous one here. But ultimately, I will tell you this, it is in fact about the humans. People are angsting these days about uh, you know, AI and machine learning and big data and robotics and all that sort of thing. But I love this quote from John Naisbitt. I think it's truer today than it's ever been. And he was talking in 1982 about the time we're in now. The most exciting breakthroughs are not going to occur because of technology, because of a greater understanding of what it means to be human. And if we're going to talk about humans, traditional HR must be a partner. How do you recruit? 
How do you interview? How do you select? How do you onboard? Probably one of the worst practices in corporate America ever. It's like a hazing ritual. How do you cross train and mentor? How do you reward? What do you reward? How do you give feedback? All these things, traditional HR practices must be different. And I'll tell you, for us, they are different. Recruiting at Menlo is about writing books, speaking at conferences, inviting people in for tours. People regularly send us their children after a tour uh, because they say, my kid would love to work in a place like this. Our interviewing and selection is different. We don't ask any questions. We make it an audition. You come in, we pair here, so we interview in pairs. And uh, we have two people working together, giving the weirdest instructions all over here in an interview. Your job is to help your pair partner succeed, even though they're competing for the same job you are. Demonstrate good kindergarten skills. And then I don't know if this video will play. Uh, no, it doesn't look like it will. That's okay. But our onboarding is literally doing work, pairing together at a computer, putting the keyboard and the mouse under the interviewee's hands during the interview process. We teach through the ears and the fingertips. That's how onboarding works here. It's not a corporate hazing ritual. Uh, feedback, we work on this all the time. That's why we read books by Crucial Learning, the Crucial Conversations books. We should be giving feedback in the moment. We should give it during the interview process. Uh, we have lots of different ways of giving feedback. We have a crazy system for giving promotions, but it's all run by the team. We have no bosses here, so that makes some things a lot easier and some things a lot harder. Um, and then firing. I mean, we, we even talk about that. Uh, we, we're the opposite of hire, uh, hire slow and fire fast. We probably hire fast and then we fire slow. It's thoughtful. It's compassionate. We don't have cardboard boxes when we fire people. We give people lots of chances to work out here. And I would say from big idea perspective down to some details, uh, there's lots of books that can help you. Um, you know, either mine or the ones I mentioned or others that uh, people know about. Start small, run experiments, figure out somebody in HR who's intrigued by these ideas as much as you are. Come in and watch one of our extreme interviews if you're nearby. It's a, actually a spectator sport at this point. Um, and uh, we offer workshops and everything we do here. So I'll stop there, Larry, and we can get on to some discussion with your uh, with your group. That's super rich. I really appreciate it. Um, there's some a few comments in the uh, in the comments now. If you have any other questions or comments, um, we will respond to them. Um, Dan uh, Moody, um, I have to throw that one in there because Dan's been a guest. He, he's he's a friend of the show. Um, he's also a good cook. He says, "Please tell me you're using a whetstone and not an electric grinder." I'm sorry to say, Dan, that I use an electric grinder. He's talking about for sharpening the knives. Um, I'm not a I'm not the pro that you are. On a on a more serious note, uh, Michael Lyons, also a friend of the show, says, "What CRM software do you use? Uh, examples of appropriate CRM software." I don't know about the second question of what appropriate CRM software would mean. It's what works for you. Uh, the one that I've been playing with, I'm I'm kind of like uh, Rich. I run the experiment, and I'm running the experiment right now is is a HubSpot, and the reason that I'm using it is it integrates directly with my email. Um, which is nice for me. So if somebody sends me an email, I can just create a, a record from it. And then I have a record of the email and then I can thread the conversation that way as opposed to through email. Um, but it's, and it's free because um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, promote my own business. And uh, as Rich knows that uh, when you, it might be a long time since he started and he might not remember, but, but money is tight when you're starting out. So free is a good price for me. So that's the one that I use, but I, I, I don't necessarily say I can recommend it. There's some things about it that I'm experimenting with. It seems to work well for me, um, but the, the real answer is what works for you. Um, Dan had another comment, which is a little more serious. He, he recognizes your voice from listening to Chief Joy Officer. <laughs> I am so glad, Larry, I got to read that book. It was killing me that I didn't yeah. get to read my first book. So. I think it's great. He said he says uh, there's parts of the book that evoke tears. I've gotten and, it a lot. Uh, and I will uh, say this is an author thing. Uh, I, I'd love to know what parts gave you tears, because I have a theory about tears uh, when reading a book. If the author was crying when he wrote it, the reader will probably cry when they read it. I think that's probably the, the true uh, that, that's a true statement. I know that there were parts uh, of the first book, Joy Inc., where I just said, this is just 
you know, so fantastic when you're talking about people. We seem to forget it so much mm-hmm. about the people thing. And, and, it, and it really, I know Dan's big on this because Dan and I have worked together and, and I think he's 100% right. And I think you're 100% right on it. My curiosity, Rich, is your perception or perspective, opinion, why more people don't realize the things that, that you do and I do and Dan does and, and others about the people aspect? I think the interference uh, that exists out in the world is reward systems. And I'm not talking about compensation. Uh, you know, you think about how many organizations the, the, the boss is revered and gets the corner office and gets the title because of how many people work for him or her. Um, and, uh, you know, and we are rewarded for working really long days and long hours. And, um, and like I said, I, when I was the hero, right. I mean, I probably was drowning out the conversations of others in the room and that's how I made my way to the top. And so all of the reward systems are kind of screwed up. Uh, and so what we like to do is get back to a purpose-based reward system, which is, who do we serve and what would delight look like for them? And it starts to change the whole perspective on why are we here? What is, because I think a lot of us forgot why we got into the software industry in the first place. Yeah, it, 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 it seems to me, and I want to ask you this question. It seems to me that there's almost a mission. It's like mission driven. I mean, you're not just there to, to, to build software. You're there to nurture people. In addition, and then software is how you ex- how you express it. It seems to me that the software, in some respects, is secondary to the people. Is is how right is that? I mean, what would you say to that? I think it's hard to pull them apart. So um, when we talk about joy here, which is a word that we hear a lot inside the room, we talk about joy. It has a very specific goal. Because we believe that people who design and develop software for a living, whether they're doing it internally as a programmer within a company or externally building products, there is only one thing that brings them joy. And it doesn't, I mean, I think they would do it for free if they had the chance. They want to see their work be meaningful, get out into the world, and delight the people it's intended to serve. They want people to come back and say, I love what you created. You made my life better because of what you did. And the trouble is we are denied that so regularly, so systematically by the way we treat software teams, but what kind of unrealistic expectations we have for them, what stupid approaches we take, or what, what you know, for instance, fact-free planning uh, that drives typical schedules and that sort of thing. The, People are just hollowed out zombies working in this environment. Uh, The number of people who come to Menlo who've literally been on the edge or have, we've got one guy, Dan, who I joked in in an earlier part of my career, uh, sort of a joke. I, I, I say it as a joke. It was real though. I was thinking of getting out of the industry when I was in my mid thirties and I was gonna start a canoe camp in the boundary waters of Minnesota, okay? And my wife and daughters laugh at me. They're like, Dad, did you really think we would follow you to the boundary waters? But that's how far away I wanted to get. There's one guy in our team, Dan, who did just that. He went up into Nevada, in the mountains of Nevada, and was hacking trails for the, you know, the modern equivalent of the Civilian Conservation Corps. And then when he came, finally came back to Michigan, he was working for a landscaping company. And the weird thing in Michigan is when you work for a landscaping company, if you don't like snow, you got to find inside work during the winter. And he thought, well, I'll give this programming thing one more shot for just a few months before springtime hits. And he came to Menlo. Yeah. He's been here for five years. He thought it would last a few months and he's been here for five years. So you know, the people part is incredibly important, but figuring out why these people got into this industry in the first place, what really drives them is also crucially important. Yeah, we got a couple more uh, comments, which is great. Um, uh, Dan has a, a theory that at least 30% of our work days are eaten up by poor relationships. Um, he says this to execs and they agree, but we can't spend the money to fix a soft cost. <laughs> what, what would be your response to that? 
Well, you know, I think everybody uh, fundamentally believes that teamwork, uh, true teamwork, like I love the quote from uh, Patrick Lencioni's work when he said, it's not finance, it's not technology, it's not strategy. It is teamwork alone that is the most competitive advantage, both because it's so powerful and so rare. Right. And so I think everybody would agree if you have a well-functioning team that's thrown in the same direction. Well, how do you build teams? Mm -hmm. You build teams based on trust. How do you build trust? You build trust by building relationships. How do you build relationships? You build relationships by spending time together. Unfortunately, most organizations segregate people off in, in the old days, in little cube farms. Now they're all working spread out at home and uh, with, you know, if they're on Zoom at all or whatever, they're meeting technology, they don't even have their cameras on. So you don't even really know if they're there or not. It's like, oh my God, how do you build relationships? How do you spend time together? If we're not doing that, we're fighting each other because we don't trust each other because we haven't built the relationships and we'll never get to teamwork. Yeah. And, co and communication being so difficult anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Um, so, Dan spaces up the part that of the story uh, was Ian and the concept of blackballing mm. was the one that that teared him up. Yep. Uh, so for those of you, those of us who haven't read it or remember it, can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah. So um, Ian is uh, was the son of one of our developers. He came to work for us. He was pretty early on in his career, and within a couple of years. Um, he was getting to a point where he was he he wasn't cutting it, it culture wise he was a good technologist but uh, culture wise and we were kind of ready to shoo him out the door and he came to us and quit and uh, we were kind of like oh thank god we were spared the pain of having to fire the son of one of our developers and um uh and then a couple of years later he wanted to come back now, I will tell you, most people, you either fire or quit, they get blackballed, they're, they're scratched out of the, the uh, book of life and all that sort of thing, and you can't, can't ever go back, right? And so um, uh, we were a little reluctant, we were a little hesitant, and we said, Ian, we're going to run you through our standard interview process. Mm -hmm. And he's like, okay, I get it. You know, I didn't, you know, I wasn't on my best behavior when I left here, so I understand what you're doing. And we came back, and he was unbelievably a better Ian when he came back. And so one day I pulled him aside and I said, Ian, what happened? He goes, Rich, you know, all that, all that stuff you do at Menlo seemed way over the top to me. It was like, you know, you guys with your pair programming and your automated unit testing and, you know, blah, 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 on and on and away. He says, he says, frankly, I thought it was all just bullshit. And then I went out into the real world. Mm -hmm. I saw the problems you and James would talk about over and over and over again that I didn't think were real. I thought you were making them up. Yeah. And then I started to try and fix them. And as I fixed them, I realized I was pulling in practices one at a time from Menlo. And he smiled. He says, do you know how hard it is to build a Menlo? I said, yeah, maybe a little bit. And he says, one day I woke up and I realized, why am I trying to rebuild Menlo? Why don't I just go back to Menlo? So we did. And he came here and he was he was wonderful. And then he left again. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he went to go run a startup or, you know, be the technical part of a startup, which we admired. You know, we, we understand that drive. And that didn't work out. So he came back again. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember writing Joy Inc. And, you know, somebody's like, oh, you know, how do you treat people you fire? And so I said, well, let me tell you the story about Ian. He's like been gone and come back three times. And she's like, what? And I said, yeah, the first time we wanted to fire him, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And she's like, oh, you got to tell that story. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's just dumb how we treat humans. Like, you know, we send them out the door with cardboard boxes and strip their, uh, their uh, you know, their badge and, you know, and don't even let them say goodbye to their friends and all that kind of stuff. It's just ridiculous. I don't know how we learn to treat humans that way. Yeah, I think it's crazy. I mean, here in, in the Bay Area, I've heard tales of, of HR people making a blackball list. So you not only get blackballed by one company, you get blackballed by a bunch of them. It's just, it's just so so ludicrous and 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 so far out of this world that I can't even imagine it. Um, I think we forget that 
you know, we are wonderful adaptive creatures. I mean, like we learn something, we adjust. I mean, I realize most of us say, oh, no, people are the same and they just stay the same. No, they don't. Yeah. You know, I'm living proof of that. I was I was a very different kind of leader in my early life. Yeah, I, I think people do have the capacity for change. I, I, I'm looking at time. We're almost done. Um, my lovely wife, Jana, who is a huge supporter of, of mine and, and likes to come to these events. I hope she likes to. Maybe she just does to support me. She says team building events are highly underrated, in her opinion. Uh, I agree. I, I think it's one of the things that we're missing with the, the, the pandemic. So there's so many questions I want to ask you. I want to end on this one, though, because when we talked earlier before we went live, we talked about the fact that you thrived during the pandemic. Can you, can you speak briefly to how you've kept that Menlo culture uh, during the pandemic, which must have been a real challenge for you? Oh, it was the biggest challenge we've ever faced in our 23 year history, Larry. Uh, and I will tell you, I panicked. I thought we lost Menlo. I mean, because it was like an instant. Everybody goes home. You know, they got to figure it out. And what was delightful was I'm trying to figure out how are we going to do this? And guess what the team did? They just did it. And I realized that the 19 years before that, we had been preparing for this moment. We didn't know we were preparing, but we were building this incredibly solid foundation. The 18 months we were away, we were spending a lot of cultural dollars from the bank account. And I will tell you now, we're, we're five days back in the office. We give the team uh, 12 elective work from home days a year. They can use as much as they want, but we want you back here. We want you in the office every day because of all that stuff we were talking about earlier. I don't know how we build human relationships when we're not together. It's just yeah. simple as that. Yeah, it's really tough, really tough. Uh, Rich, pleasure always. Love to see you. Uh, the the two books for the for those who didn't catch it before, and hopefully we'll get some we'll get some links in there. Is 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 Joy Inc. and then Chief Joy Officer was your second book. Um, Menlo Innovations, wonderful place. I hope to see you again in person someday soon too. Um, uh, I hope to get out to Ann Arbor one of these days too. We'd um, love to have you, Larry. But if you're ever uh, in the Bay Area, um, don't hesitate um, because I, I know John and I would love to take you out for dinner and, and, and continue to talk with you about this wonderful thing you've created because uh, it's rare, unfortunately, in the world. And you've been able to do that. And I really appreciate you and all your generosity, spending time with me, spending time with my nonprofit, and now spending time with my little LinkedIn live show. Um, I want to remind people that most Fridays we're here, noon Pacific. There's some that we miss for whatever reason. We can't get a guest or, or I actually have something else to do. Please join us. It's free. We have a lot of fun. We bring in good people like Rich to talk. We try to answer all your questions. Um, any parting thoughts, Rich? You know, all I will say is what we talk, just got done talking about, uh, it's hard. But what it really is, is it's important. And, uh, you know, hopefully just our conversation has inspired some of your listeners to think differently, to think about experiments they could run uh, to make difference. Because um, the, the, it, it is that important, especially right now. I appreciate that. I hope so, too, Rich. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. We hope to see you again in the future. Uh, again, thanks to my uh, guest today, Rich Sheridan. Uh, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.